All right. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to UCSF Medicine Grand Rounds. I'm your host, Lakshmi Santosh, filling in for our chair, Dr. Bob Wachter, while he's away. Today, I'm delighted to present two outstanding speakers who are going to teach us a lot about from pipettes to populations, building an integrated program from ID research and education. We're really going to hear about these novel techniques of molecular surveillance and how to approach emerging pathogens not that we have any recent experience with emerging pathogens that have reshaped our world. So first, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Isabel Rodriguez Baraque. Um, Dr. Rodriguez Baraque is co-director of the Epicenter. She's an associate professor in the division of HIV, ID, and global medicine. And she's really interested in applying epidemiological and statistical methods to understand the dynamics of infectious disease. Most of her experience was actually related to vector-borne diseases, such as dengue, malaria, and Zika. She completed her medical training in Colombia, followed by a PhD in epidemiology and a master's in biostatistics at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. And we've been lucky to have her at UCSF since 2017. This is gonna be a tag team. I'm also delighted to introduce Dr. Brian Gre Greenhouse, also co-director of the Epicenter. He is a professor in the division of HIV, ID, and global medicine. And his research program really combines laboratory and analytical tools to understand the transmission epidemiolo epidemiology and immunology of malaria, primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa and beyond. And we've been lucky to have him at UCSF since 2004, where he completed his ID subspecialty training, as well as a master's in biostatistics at Berkeley. So we're in for an exciting talk. Thank you so much to our two speakers. <clears throat> okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so I think we're going to start uh, by, by stating a fact that may be obvious to, to many people in the audience, which is that despite the fact that chronic diseases now plus are responsible for the largest burden and mortality of, of all diseases, infectious diseases continue to cause significant morbidity and mortality with over 20% of disability adjusted life years attributed to infectious diseases. And, and this number is actually much greater if we focus on uh, lower socio-demographic index countries where it gets up to 40% or, or if you focus on, on uh, pediatric populations. And we're hearing all over the news. I mean, we, we, we've we just come out or are, of four years uh, of, of COVID-19, but beyond new diseases, there's lots of talk about re-emerging diseases like sick or cholera uh, and also uh, re-emergence or increasing case of many endemic and all diseases, including influenza, malaria, antimicrobial resistant, TB, and uh, bacteria. So uh, pathogens are small, but have uh, global uh, implications. And, and a question that I have for the audience is, at what scale uh, do you think we should be uh, studying uh, infectious diseases? Is it at the tiny microbe scale, or is it at the population scale? And we would argue that uh, all of them, uh, because even a small changes in a pathogen, let's say a mutation in a spike protein, can have rapidly major implications worldwide. And if you are happy with that premise that this is really a cross-scale problem, then it is almost obvious that you need people from these different disciplines to study infectious diseases. Uh, basic uh, lab scientists, clinicians, uh, and epidemiologists uh, and population scientists in general. And of course, you also need computers and data analytics to tie all of this data together. Uh, but is it really enough if these people are studying infectious diseases uh, independently? And, and we would argue that the answer to that question is definitely no, right? Because, and, and we're gonna motivate this answer with, with a simple example. So let's imagine you have two populations of the same size that undergo an outbreak by an infectious disease. And, and these two curves show what the epidemic curves look for population A and population B. Uh, based on just these two curves, in which city do you think it would be easier to control this pathogen? Who would say population A? Who would say population B? So yeah, just based on, on cases over time and the fact that there were fewer cases in population B, you would be, maybe many people would be inclined to think that population B is easier uh, to control. 
right? But if you had data from, let's say, serological surveys before the outbreak, you might learn that over two thirds of the population of population B was already immune to this disease, right? Um, and despite all of them not being susceptible to infection, like a fraction would inf got infected, right? So if population B had been fully susceptible, this is what the outbreak might have looked like, right? <clears throat> and the reason for this is that in communicable diseases, as opposed to chronic diseases or, or most environmental diseases, uh, really the susceptibility profile of the population di dictates the dynamics that you see at the population level. So you cannot really study transmission dynamics without uh, studying immunity. And, and later in the talk, uh, uh, we're also gonna argue that you need to understand transmission in order to, to uh, study uh, immunity properly. So in this particular case, uh, even though population B <clears throat> uh, had a smaller outbreak, in fact, it would be harder to control the infectious disease in that population uh, because transmission potential was higher. Thanks. Um, so these are really hard problems. Uh, they require multiple domains of expertise. And for these reasons, Isabel and I are proponents of a systems epidemiology approach to infectious diseases. Um, we believe that the best insight into these important questions across different scales can be gained by starting with well-designed human studies and layering on top of this laboratory assays and computational analysis. All right, so this is the outline of our talk. We're gonna talk a bit about who we are and what we do, and then give three research vignettes going from populations down to pipettes. Uh, and then we'll summarize at the end. So who are we? We're the Epicenter. Um, Isabel and I founded the Epicenter in 2019 with strong institutional support. Uh, our motivation at the time was to create a space for interdisciplinary collaborative infectious disease work beyond that which we could uh, obtain in either of our groups alone. Our current focus is on multiple infectious diseases, um, uh, but mostly malaria, arboviruses, respiratory viruses, and we're moving with some new collaborators to antimicrobial resistance and multi-pathogen surveillance. Here are the PIs. In addition to Isabel and I, we have two other outstanding faculty. We have Jessica Briggs, who's been part of our division uh, for a few years now. She's an assistant professor, works primarily on malaria. And we're really thrilled to welcome Nicola Mueller joining just this month uh, as a faculty member at UCSF. His research program is going to be on uh, phylogenetic methods for viruses and also characterizing the emergence and evolution of antimicrobial resistance. Beyond the PIs are 20 of us. Um, and this is, these are the people that uh, are why we can do what we do and why we love coming to work every day. Beyond our group, we benefit greatly from fantastic network of collaborators, um, from colleagues and mentors within our division particularly Phil Rosenthal and Grant Dorsey, to, in, in, to international ones, including our longstanding relationship with the wonderful team at Infectious Disease Research Collaboration in Uganda. Uh, the ones we rely on most are listed here, but there are many others that are also a, a, an important part of our, our research team. Okay, I'll move on now to what we do. So obviously we focus on research, but we have a really strong um, focus on training as well. It's, it's as integral to our mission as the research part. Um, we have multiple graduate and postdoctoral trainees. Uh, we also have a lot of international trainees, including multiple international projects with formal mentoring components and capacity building. Um, as part of these, we've developed workshops for genomic epidemiology. We, over the last uh, three or four years, we've designed and led four workshops in Africa for malaria genomics, are working on translating some of those materials into an interactive online course for genomics that's going to be freely available who, to anyone who wants to take it. We're very excited about that. And we're working with the uh, fa fabulous um, curriculum design team uh, in global health sciences. It's not enough just to create solutions to your own problems. Um, these problems are really hard. And for that reason, we feel like generating resources for the community is, is another part and part of, a, of what we do. Um, as part of this, we've developed software packages for data analysis and management. Um, we've developed laboratory methods and protocols, all of which are freely shared on our website. Um, we have publicly available data sets and training materials. And we've also been convening networks of like-minded individuals to solve challenging pro problems um, across disciplines. Uh, Isabel and I also wanted to highlight our Epicenter seminar series. 
We've had 22 really wonderful speakers to date. Uh, we've highlighted established and early career scientists from academia, industry, and public health. Um, we have uh, both an in-person and hybrid format, depending on the speaker. And if you'd like to stay in the loop, please email epicenter with two Ps at ucsf.edu to sign up, or you can find out more information on our website, epicenter.ucsf.edu. Okay, I'll let Isabel take it off with our first research vignette. So uh, for, for our first research vignette, uh, let's go back to spring, summer of 2020. So the days of the early pandemic. Uh, back then, let's say April or, or May 2020, uh, many countries or most countries had implemented very strict social distancing measures going from stay at home orders all the way to very strict lockdowns. Um, COVID cases were, were being reported everywhere, but, but we really didn't know what was going on in terms of transmission. So there were many questions that, that were being asked, including how many people have been infected uh, by SARS-CoV-2, uh, who's at risk of infection versus disease, uh, what is the infection fatality rate? Uh, and we were even asking in April or May 2020 whether we had reached herd immunity yet. And, and this is like, a, 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 I, I got this from the BBC News Archive, uh, and this is from July 2020, and they published this, already claiming that maybe herd immunity had changed the course of the pandemic. Little did we know back then. But anyway, uh, the problem is that you cannot answer any of these questions with case data alone. You need surprising studies uh, to know who has been infected, right? And the gold standard for surprising studies usually are population-based serial surveys. Um, where you go out and, and sample a random subset or probabilistic subset of the population. But the problem is that these are very expensive. And as a result, they're infrequently performed at, at very few locations. In fact, the USA didn't perform a single national representative serial surveys throughout the whole pandemic. Other countries did achieve it, but, but in general, there were very few. Um, so uh, early in the pandemic, we, we started thinking how can we contribute to answer uh, uh, some of these questions? And, 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 and we knew we probably couldn't go out and do population-based surveys, but we thought uh, millions of people are having blood drawn for clinical labs all the time. Can we use those, right? So the criticism for this type of design based on residual SERA is the question of whether it is representative or not. But our thought was maybe if we leverage like rich electronic medical record data, and select appropriately, we can approximate what a population-based survey would, would, would look like. Not, not everyone is sick. There's people that are uh, bled for, for, for checkups, for prenatal visits. Uh, and yes, EMR data can allow a much more representative sampling, potentially, if we leverage it, as compared, for example, from to, to uh, blood donors. Uh, so yeah, so, so we wonder if properly selected samples could be useful to answer some of these questions. So that's what we did. We decided to work with the UCSF and SFDPH health networks and set up a system called uh, Scale It for uh, yeah, surveillance for continuous actionable epidemiologic intelligence of transmission. We thought this was going to be uh, super easy. Uh, ah, and this really was an effort that involved the whole epicenter, which was very nice at the time, like everyone contributed from their expertise, epidemiology, all the way to lab developing the serological assays that didn't exist back then uh, and optimizing them. And we thought this would be super easy. We'll just pick up the samples in the lab, test them, analyze them, and that's it. But of course, things end up being uh, very complicated, like even merging the EMRs to the lab data sets, picking up at three different clinical labs, biobanking, uh, assay optim optimization. Again, serological assay standards didn't exist, but then, back then everyone was trying to optimize assays in parallel. And of course, funding, uh, which we didn't get any or very little, was, was a limiting factor. Uh, but regardless, we were able to, to, to collect samples at two periods of time during the pandemic. We would have hoped to do that for longer, but, but we, we did uh, weekly collections uh, between March to June 2020, so the first wave of the pandemic in San Francisco, uh, and then intensive sampling uh, after uh, the first December wave. So we intensive sample in February 2022. And the difference is that in February 2022, where we're not just measuring antibodies against infection, but also trying to tease out what proportion of the population had been 
uh, vaccinated. Uh, so again, we leverage the UCSF and SFDPH networks that obtain uh, over 50,000 blood draws per month. So we had a lot, a lot to select from. And we spent quite a bit of time thinking of our sample selection algorithm to make it as representative as possible of the San Francisco population. Uh, and we use the EMR data for this. So uh, we only included patients residing in San Francisco, including, uh, of course, the homeless population. Um, for adults, we focused on outpatients um, and emergency visits, uh, trying to get, a, let's say, as, as people that were not as sick. Uh, for children, this is not possible because children get bled less often. So we had to include also inpatient and outpatient. But importantly, we weighted by age, group, and zip code to get at representativity at the city level. Uh, and of course, we excluded patients that were being tested for COVID because they were coming in with symptoms for COVID. Um, this slide shows the representativity that we uh, were able to achieve uh, with our sampling strategy. This uh, figure to the left shows the age distribution by epi week of sample collection uh, for a scaled it one, so the first year of sample collection. And we were able to get like very good representativity of all age, all age groups, except young kids maybe uh, where, 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 where we definitely had uh, fewer samples. Um, and then this shows the correlation of our population to the actual population in residing in each of these zip codes, again, to show like a good representativity at the zip code level. Um, and these are the main results for the for the first round. Uh, we estimated that by June 2020, only 4.4% of the population in San Francisco uh, had been infected uh, by COVID. But our results also so our, our results also show a stark heterogeneity, both spatially, with much higher attack rates in in neighborhoods in the southeast of the city, like Bayview and also much higher at attack rates by certain demographic groups, so Hispanic uh, and Black populations uh, in particular. Um, but, and, and homeless populations even higher, up to 10%. Uh, but this heterogeneity was even more stark when we returned in 2021 and looked at both infection and vaccination. Uh, so by February, 2020, still most of, of, of San Francisco uh, hadn't been infected, right? Like m m most of the neighborhoods, but there were some neighborhoods again in the Southeast that had very high seropositivity rates to natural infection. So up to 20%, right? But was even more, uh, yeah, the, 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 this study showed that that, that was uh, negative was that the image for vaccination was exactly the opposite, right? Like, so the neighborhoods that had the highest attack rates were the neighborhoods that by February 2020, 2021, sorry, uh, had the lowest vaccination uh, coverage rates. And fortunately, this was uh, corrected like as vaccination progressed and, and San Francisco achieved uh, very high vaccination coverages. Uh, but I think this figure illustrates uh, an example of how, why this approach can be so powerful, right? Like achieving this extent of a spatial resolution would be very or probably prohibitively expensive if you were to use population-based sampling. Uh, so as a summary for vignette one, we think that search surveillance from lab tests, residual sera could serve as a sustainable continuous platform for, for COVID, but also other infectious diseases, uh, because it's, it's probably a sweet spot that allows for frequent local sampling, approaching representativity of the population, um, and yeah, and it's, and it's much cheaper. So the next question that we're asking is, can if we can apply a similar approach to other diseases in other settings, uh, and, and we are co-investigators now in the California Center for Outbreak Readiness. This is part of CDC's new network of outbreak, of outbreak preparedness sites, one of 13 networks in the country <clears throat> that were established to expand the outbreak uh, response capacity nationwide. Um, this C core in particular is led by Kans Kaiser Permanente Southern California, uh, and what we're doing within that project is using Kaiser Permanente's network to more broadly assess the feasibility of using residual sera for sur sur surveillance. So this is an insured population of over five million people, and what we plan to evaluate are different use cases: epidemic versus endemic diseases, for example, or high-risk populations, different spatial temporal resolutions, 
and, and whether we can actually use multiplex assays to look at numerous infectious diseases at the same time. All right, thanks. Uh, all right, we'll move on to vignette two. We'll have time for questions at the end, so please save them up. Um, so vignette two is, uh, changes gear a little bit, still talking about populations, but moving a little bit more towards genomic epidemiology. And, and here we'll be talking about malaria resurgence in the Horn of Africa. So uh, most of you probably are familiar with malaria, but it's a parasitic pathogen. It's transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, people develop immunity to illness after repeated exposure or may or may not develop actually immunity to infections. Um, over the last 20 years, we've actually had some really substantial improvements in, in malaria control. The graph on the right from the WHO shows a decline in the number of cases per thousand population at risk uh, over the last 20 years in Africa. And as you can see, we had a really a substantial decline from 2000 to around 2018. Um, and that's largely due to effective anti-malarial therapy uh, and, and vector control. So giving people uh, insecticide treated bed nets and doing indoor residual spraying of insecticides in houses. Unfortunately, we've had some substantial disruptions to care and to delivery of interventions during the COVID pandemic, and also in general. I mean, some of these, some of these systems are not very robust uh, and people often don't get enough nets. Um, there's also developing resistance to antimalarial drugs and to insecticides, which are concerning. So really in, emblematic of the problem is Deirdala. It's a small city in Ethiopia, which is in the Horn of Africa, uh, illustrated on the map at left. Um, it's an area where malaria was once endemic, but really had benefited from these malaria control interventions. Malaria was really on its way out up until a few years ago. Unfortunately, as you can see at right, looking at the blue bars, falciparum malaria, which is the most common and fatal form, uh, cases were up over three, threefold in just a few years. And the question was why. Um, I wanna acknowledge that this study was, was designed and led by a colleague, Fitzem, uh, who's based in Ethiopia. And we played a, an important role in the study, but, but it was uh, conceived by him. So why was malaria up so much in just a few years? We had a few hypotheses, actually. There were multiple potential reasons, and we need to know which were in play to address the problem. Uh, I'm gonna walk you through each of these four potentials um, over the next few slides, but we are looking at a potential for an invasive vector species, importation of malaria, drug resistance, or diagnostic resistance. So Anopheles stevens eye is actually a very concerning mosquito. It's an invasive vector originally from South Asia, which has recently invaded Africa. You can see it right, its progression in the last decade from the Horn of Africa all the way uh, to West Africa. Um, and it's got, done quite well in urban environments. It's actually really well adapted for urban and man-made environments. And this is particularly a problem in Africa where 50% of the population now lives in urban areas and that's rapidly increasing. Uh, also of concern, this particular mosquito is resistant to insecticides. Uh, importation of, of, malaria, of cases of infectious diseases is, is true for any pathogen, but particularly true for malaria where you've got local, um, local susceptibility and you've got local vectors. Um, and particularly in areas where transmission is unstable or low, there's higher risk of uh, imported cases making a, a, a big effect on, on transmission locally. So that was another concern. Um, as with many pathogens and where we have effective treatments, unfortunately, the, the pathogen has evolved uh, resistance. Um, I'm just highlighting one of the drugs that we use, uh, artemisinins. It's really the mainstay of antimalarial combination therapy. Um, and mutations associated with partial resistance first sprang up a few decades ago in Southeast Asia and were more recently seen in East Africa for the last few years. Finally, something some, somewhat unique to, to malaria probably is that it has recently evolved diagnostic resistance. So we used to use microscopy to diagnose malaria, but but in the last decade or so, we've moved towards rapid diagnostic tests, which most of you are now familiar with, thanks to the pandemic. Instead of testing a nasal swab, they'll test a drop of blood. And these are so much easier to use and don't require trained personnel that they've really um, uh, replaced microscopy in much of Africa. Unfortunately, the, the best tests that we have and the most commonly used detect a protein that is non-essential for the parasite. And the parasite has evolved the deletion of that protein these, these parasites with uh, deleted HRP2 protein are completely undetectable by these, H, uh, by these rapid diagnostic tests. So FISM uh, designed a very elegant study to simultaneously test all four of these hypotheses. Um, there was epidemiologic surveillance, um, so efficient study design capturing cases from health facilities, um, as well as controls, so people presenting with febrile illness who tested negative for malaria. Uh, 
The study team then went back to the houses of the cases and controls and tested all household members uh, for presence of malaria parasites. There was also entomologic surveillance. So both adult and larvae, uh, and, uh, larvae forms were, were collected in the immediate areas of both case and control households. And finally, we performed molecular surveillance. So that included taking the abdomens of mosquitoes and doing PCR for blood meals so they could see what species of mammals they were biting, taking the heads and the thorax of the same mosquitoes and doing a PCR to see if they were infective with malaria parasites, and finally doing PCR for uh, malaria parasites in humans uh, from, the, from the samples from cases and controls and household members, and then doing uh, genomics of the malaria parasites. So first tackling our first question, was this due to this invasive uh, vector species? And the answer seemed to be yes. Um, uh, stronger evidence than any study previously performed, there had been some circumstantial evidence before, but here in this study, uh, uh, we were able to show that Anopheles stevens I, but not the other predominant vectors were detected three times more often near cases than controls. Looking at the, the human PCR infection data, we also found out that household members had an odds ratio of 3.7 of being parasitemic by PCR if this vector was found nearby. So not only the cases, but also transmission to other members in the household uh, was strongly associated with the presence of this invasive species. And finally, by using PCR, we not only identified that there was an association of, of human infection, but also that uh, these vectors had directly fed on humans and were also infected with malaria parasites. They were the only species, um, despite being the minority of the, of the mosquitoes found, they were the only ones that had uh, evidence of infection with the human malaria parasites. So what about the other three questions, importation, drug, and diagnostic resistance? Well, parasite genomics can actually help us test all of these hypotheses, but how are we going to do this? We could do whole genome sequencing, but malaria parasites have a pretty big genome, and whole genome sequencing would be slow, expensive, not very sensitive for these small blood samples, and also, also give us mostly wasted data. 99% of the genome has no variation, and we don't really care what the sequences are there. But if we have a targeted approach and sequence just the areas we need, we can get much more efficient deep sequencing of, of what we want. Uh, and our team had previously designed a panel specifically to answer questions about malaria transmission and parasite phenotypes uh, we called Mad Hatter, uh, which looks at over 200 loci, and you can perform hundreds of assays in a, in a in a week for only about $10 a sample. So we performed the sequencing for 131 infections and found something really surprising. There's extraordinary diversity of, of, of malaria parasites throughout Africa, but in this area, 98% of the infections belong to only one of two distinct lineages. Um, and if you look at the bottom, that kind of cluster of, of, of parasites that was labeled lineage one, that comprised about 85% of the cases. They were all highly related to each other, they were there since the beginning and, and persisted throughout, uh, and they had no mutations associated with either Artemis and resistance or HRP2 deletion. So this basically rules out importation as a strong driver of transmission in this area. It could be happening at some low level, but whatever parasite or parasites was there were just continuing to spread locally, likely due to the, to the presence of this invasive vector. What about drug and diagnostic resistance? Fortunately, this predominant clone of the malaria parasites had neither mutation. But when we looked at the other lineage that came partway through the study uh, and, and comprised about 15% of cases, we identified both artemisinin and, and HRP2 mutations in the same lineage. So very concerning um, for, for the development of both drug and diagnostic resistance and the spread in this, in this circumstance. So as a summary of this vignette, um, there were four important threats that were identified for malaria resurgence uh, and we were able to evaluate them in a single efficient study combining field epidemiology and molecular surveillance. Field, field epidemiology was required to generate the data and the samples and showed a strong spatial association of malaria uh, parasites with Anopheles stevens I. The PCR data additionally identified association of household infections, which were low density and needed PCR for detection with the presence of the vector in the area. And we also proved that the, the vector was biting humans and was transmitting malaria. The parasite genomics allowed us to additionally show that local transmission was occurring and that importation was not really responsible for the outbreak. Um, in addition, and we identified a very concerning lineage of drug and diagnostic resistant parasites that was not causing the outbreak, but likely being facilitated by the outbreak. 
Um, as a result of this and similar studies, the, the World Health Organization and multiple stakeholders are working on a containment strategy uh, for this malaria triple threat in the Horn of Africa. And more broadly, we at the EpiCenter are working with partners throughout Africa to implement malaria genomic surveillance, including laboratory methods, bioinformatics, and data analysis. And Faith, who's here in the audience, um, just came back from South Africa about a week ago where she's been working on getting that assay up and running. Thanks, Faith. All right, vignette number three, our last one. So yeah, so for vignette uh, number three, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about cohort studies and, and, and the example we chose for this are longitudinal studies of infection and immunity uh, that uh, we've been part of for, for over 10 years. And here, like a lot of, I mean, these are conducted in, in collaboration with IDRC uh, in Uganda. And, and many of these efforts have been led by uh, Grant Dorsey and, and Phil Rosenthal uh, at, at UCSF. So uh, yeah, they, 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 they definitely uh, wouldn't happen if it was just us. Uh, so uh, up to now, uh, we've focused on population studies, right? And, and, and using population studies to, to population level studies to uh, look at questions about transmission, right? Uh, but, but maybe uh, that approach is not enough if, if you wanna learn something about immunity. So uh, as an example, let's look at the, at the at, at these are two timelines of two individuals in, in one of our cohorts. And here I'm showing the data from passive surveillance, right? So uh, these two individuals uh, had uh, two episodes of clinical malaria, yeah? the red dots uh, in, in this period of time. Based on this data, uh, would you think these people are equally immune to malaria? Who says yes, equally immune to malaria? Who says no? Who says we don't know? Okay, so yeah, the, 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 the correct answer uh, is, is, is probably, we don't know because you know, we, know, we know that as, as Brian said, uh, malaria, people develop immunity to malaria and, and, and then can have malaria asymptomatically. So uh, our cohort studies in Uganda have followed people both actively uh, and passively, so with monthly visits where, where parasites get, get measured, uh, and, and passively for, for over 10 years uh, in multiple settings. And now in the next figure, I'm gonna overlay the data from uh, active surveillance and what detection using microscopy shows, right? So you can already tell that these two individuals are extremely different. Uh, the top one truly only had two malaria infections, in this period of time, while the bottom one was persistently infected. But what if we layer an even more sensitive detection method like qPCR? Then you get this. So even more evidence that the uh, individual in the bottom uh, was continuously infected uh, throughout uh, uh, the whole study duration. Uh, and based, based on this data, uh, then, who would you say is more immune? The one on the top or the one on the bottom? Who says the top? Who says the bottom? So yeah, they were uh, consistent, persistently infected and, 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 and rarely developing disease. Turns out that the top one was a four-year-old kid. The bottom one is an 11-year-old kid. So the bottom one probably has had more time, has been exposed and, and has had more time to develop immunity to malaria. So we've collected this type uh, of data consistently for hundreds and hundreds of individuals over uh, many years of follow-up. And, and this type of data has led us uh, do analysis like this one to characterize the development of clinical immunity uh, well, using this rich longitudinal data. So uh, these two figures uh, show how individuals develop uh, immunity to, to clinical phenotypes of immunity that we've defined to the left is anti-parasite immunity. So it's an individual's ability to control parasite upon infection. So essentially whether you develop high parasite densities or low parasite densities when you're infected. Uh, and the one to the right is what we call anti-disease immunity. So it's the, an individual's ability to tolerate high, high, high parasite infection. So your ability to have like live with very high parasite densities without developing a fever. And that's what each of these panels uh, are showing us. 
And here, what we are uh, trying to show are the independent relationships that EIR, which is a metric of exposure, the entomological inoculation rate, so essentially the number of infectious bites that an individual receives per year, uh, and age have on, on these two phenotypes of immunity. And because of this rich data, we were able to show independent effects uh, of both, right? And, and in both cases, you see how people, as they age, they do not only experience lower parasite densities, but also tolerate higher parasite densities uh, without uh, developing fever. But is this enough, right? Like, is, is just parasite detection, uh, positive or negative, enough to say what's going on? And, and, and the answer is no, because this same timeline could result, for example, for a person that has, let's say, two infectious bites, right? That, 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 and simply they, they, they are carrying those parasites asymptomatically for, for extended periods of time, or they could result from a very different scenario, which is this, right? Like many, many infectious bites. Uh, and, and those would be like very different stories in terms of immunity, right? So detection of parasites is definitely not enough by itself to quantify transmission. Uh, so we've actually been genotyping uh, these parasites uh, by sequencing a highly diverse segment of the apical membrane protein. And this is work that has been spearheaded by Jessica Briggs, which is one of the PIs uh, at, the, at the epicenter. And this is what this data looks for, for that individual. So essentially each row uh, in the bottom plot shows a different malaria clone identified uh, uh, in this individual over, over time. And, and what this shows is that th this person had like over 20 different distinct clones uh, of, of malaria over this period of time. Uh, and yet they only had two episodes of, of, of symptomatic malaria. So lots of exposure, an amazing amount of exposure, but also uh, lots and lots uh, of immunity. And probably this is more what, what the exposure profile of this person might look like. Now, if you do have like this kind of data, then you can, and, and you have it for multiple pe people, you can start reconstructing transmission at a population level. So Ki Wang, that is a graduate student working in our group, uh, used this data to estimate forces of infection uh, as a function. And in this case, like, like we're putting it against date, right? Uh, for, for our cohorts and compare them to incidence of malaria, right? So in red, you have the force of infection, which is the rate at which people are getting malaria clones. And, and, and in blue, you have the incidence of uh, malaria disease. Uh, and what this grab, grab, uh, figure shows is that unsurprisingly, there's like a, a really big gap and malaria incidence can uh, really underestimate uh, the true force of infection by three, like three times or, or, or four times. Uh, and, and what's interesting about this is that this happened during a period of resurgence of malaria uh, in this population when there was very little malaria at the beginning, but then there was a resurgence due to changes in, in, in the control policy. And, and you, can, you can just see that how that gaps grow. But beyond quantifying transmission, this data is super nice because it lets you uh, revisit fundamental questions of the natural history of, uh, of, of malaria that are elusive, right? Like uh, questions like, that, that, like how long does an infection last have only been answered by very specific experimental studies where, the, where they expose people in, 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 in yeah, control conditions of, of, of some sort. So, but, but, but if you start having like this level of granularity of data from natural infection in endemic settings, you can, you, you can get at these questions. So for example, uh, one thing that is traditionally observed in malaria is that males tend to carry, have like higher prevalence of malaria than females. And, and presumably some people even say higher incidence, but, but, but generally it's just due to that they find parasites more, 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 more frequently in the blood. And it's not known if that's behavioral, right? Like, or it was not known if that's behavioral, they're getting exposed more or something else. And, and Jessica Briggs uh, used, uh, data like the one I showed to really estimate how long infections were lasting in individuals. And what she found is that females clear infections 
twice as fast as males, right? So maybe this discrepancy uh, in prevalence was not behavioral, but was just because of uh, immunity or, or some host specific differences, females were uh, clearing up uh, infections uh, much faster uh, than males. Uh, and so these are just two examples. Now, working with uh, close collaborators uh, like uh, Pras at Stanford and, and some members, of course, of, of, of the Epicenter, we're now leveraging this fantastic platform uh, to really uh, learn things uh, about malaria human interactions. Uh, uh, so what we're doing is beyond the, let's say, genotyping data that I, I already mentioned, we're sequencing the, the whole genome se sequencing of, of the parasite, but also collecting different types of immunomics data, so antibody repertoire, post transcriptome, uh, and cellular, cellular uh, phenotyping to get at questions uh, of malaria human interactions uh, in endemic settings. So some of the questions that we're asking uh, are, well, studying the evolution of immune responses with age and repeat exposure, looking at the importance of strain-specific immunity, um, and looking at immune states associated with symptomatic versus asymptomatic infections. Uh, but we really think, and we really want to stress that, uh, having this, being, having the capacity to have like this holistic approach and having like these very well characterized cohorts uh, where we actually know the, the, the transmission history or the infection history of individuals uh, is fundamental to be able to then do ne the next step and, and answer uh, some of these questions properly. Uh, as a summary of, of this third vignette, uh, longitudinal studies coupled with high, highly sensitive molecular methods allow detailed reconstruction of infection histories that are necessary to study uh, immunity and uh, natural history of, of uh, plasmodium falciparum infection uh, in the field, I guess. Uh, in this case, just want to emphasize that all of these components have been have been super important. The field, the epidemiology, the core study was is fundamental to capture asymptomatic infections, but also to capture the clinical data, the PCR data, or highly sensitive detection methods. It's important to identify additional infections. Uh, parasite genomics uh, reveals the next layer of complexity of multiplicity of infection, and then immunological profiling uh, will allow studying the complex development of immunity. Uh, uh, hopefully. In this population. Yeah. Thanks, Isabel. All right, we're almost done, guys. Good job. Um, so the title of our talk was um, From Pipettes to Populations, but thinking of this in one dimension is really a gross oversimplification. Um, doing this work and doing it well requires a team with multidimensional expertise in design and implementation of a range of study types, domain area knowledge, data generation, mathematical modeling, statistics, and bioinformatics, to name a few. Um, and here is a, uh, using a proprietary algorithm, uh, Isabel and I uh, made a two-dimensional uh, two projection of uh, how we're trying to train the next generation of, of infectious disease scientists. Um, and really our goal is to, by providing an immersive environment with um, diverse expertise that really encourages peer mentorship and including, to mentor including uh, mentorship from us, um, we've creating a space that we really are hoping is going to encourage junior scientists um, to take a broad perspective in tackling the most pressing questions in infectious disease, whatever tools are needed. And with that, we'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, we've already thanked our, our team and our, our fantastic collaborators, but we'd also like to thank um, the Department of Medicine and our division for their continued support uh, and, and also some of our funders. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dr. Rodriguez Barraque and Dr. Greenhouse. Oh, you okay there? Mm -hmm. um, this was a fascinating talk and I was impressed by the wide variety of research methods that you all used to study these questions. I mean, truly you had a number of different approaches. I see a question in the audience. Oh, go ahead. All right, well, I have three questions. Okay, well, <laughs> great and say who you are so everyone knows who you are. All right, Joanne Engel. 
Um, so from the first, your first video, were you able to go back and look at monkeypox uh, statistics? So not 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 from not not from that sampling, right? But that's one of the uh, case studies that we are hoping to do with the new funding that we have through the CDC funded project. So one of the case studies that we're thinking about is actually monkeypox with a focus on high risk populations versus general populations. Second question, you should repeat my question then to people on Zoom. Yeah. Um, so the diagnostic resistance in the malaria outbreak, um, obviously parasites aren't getting resistant to getting tested per se. Can you just comment a little bit about the origin of that deletion? Sure. That yeah. The I, happens to be on what the test is. So the question was about the, uh, the origin of the HRP2 deletion that uh, rendered osteoporin parasites uh, resistant to diagnose or invisible to diagnostics in East Africa. Um, it was actually first discovered in South America where there was no rapid diagnostic test being used. Uh, it's unclear actually what the reason for that evolution was at that time. I'm, people were using microscopy there, just showed up, you know, with the deletion, unlike other mutations, it's hard to revert back to, to gaining the, you know, the segment of DNA back. So once you have it, it's a one-way street. Um, in East Africa, there are some people now thinking that it is being pressured um, based on treatment of, of people um, with, without the deletion. So if you, you know, in a lower transmission area, most people that get infected are going to get sick. If you get sick, you're going to go to a health facility. If they test you with a rapid diagnostic test and you're positive, we'll treat you. That's going to kill all the parasites, hopefully. They don't, if they're not drug resistant, and they will be very unlikely to be transmitted to other people. However, if you go and somebody tests you and you show up negative and they're like, oh, it must be something else, and they don't treat you, you then have your, your infection for a much longer period of time. You can infect dozens of mosquitoes and then they can go on to infect other people. So it's plausible that in these settings, there is now selection for the continued um, uh, propagation of the deleted parasites. But at least in South America, example you gave, there, there was not a test evolutionary pressure. So no. you do like side by side plus and minus deletion is obviously it's in vitro in the laboratory, but is there any reason for it to have become fixed or maintained? Yeah, that's beyond my, my scope of knowledge. I know there are other people that study that in a bit more detail. Um, I'm not sure if there are any uh, additional selective pressures for the deletion. Um, uh, there are, I, I, we have a, a, a really talented bioinformatician who's going to be joining our, our group as a, as a postdoc in July. And he's been studying actually the mechanisms, the ge genomic mechanisms for these del deletions. Some of them are actually translocations that may actually involve a duplication of another gene that may actually be associated with drug resistance. So there might be uh, ancillary uh, reasons for, for the deletion because of homology between two different genes and different chromosomes. And more, more complicated than I understand. And the risk of taking over all of us. My last question is a more general one. Um, so some of the areas you're, you're moving, you know, targeting, which is, uh, you know, pandemic outbreaks as well as drug resistance. Other, there are other groups on campus and, and in the neighborhoods people are looking at that. Can you comment about how your how your groups will interface and collaborate? So I mean, first of all, yeah, we're we're always open and 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 looking for for collaborators and, and we and we try uh, to kind of collaborate as, as much as, as, as we can uh, with other people. So we collaborate, for example, and a lot of this work that we presented was done as well uh, in close collaboration with the Biohub. Um, and and we keep expanding collaborations and uh, with them uh, in different areas, uh, but also, for example, Nicola uh, Mueller, that is the new faculty member that that, that just joined, he's he's very uh, interested in antimicrobial resistance, so he's already in touch or has started conversations with with a a, a few people to 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 expand those collaborations. I don't know if you. Have to do. I'm sorry, the question was about collaborating. <laughs> I had a question from sort of a medical education perspective. I love how you are using the epicenter as a vehicle to kind of build um, scientific capacity, both locally and abroad. Can you talk about maybe some of the barriers that you've had to overcome in launching these workshops and how do you overcome those barriers in building this international capacity? Yeah, thanks. It's a, it's a great question. These are things that we're very passionate about, but you and others who are involved in medical education know that it's, it tends to be undervalued compared to other aspects. So it's been hard to get funding and support um, for this type of work. Um, the first 
virtual workshop we did during the pandemic for Africa, we just kind of did on our own dime. Um, we did a few other workshops that were tangentially associated with projects so we had travel funding, but essentially uh, me and other colleagues basically just volunteered our time to do that. We finally did get some funding from the Gates Foundation to put together this online course, which leverages a lot of the work that we put into this to try to expand the reach. Um, but still, it's relatively small. I, I would say, you know, right now, the biggest benefit that we have, is we have people in our group that are really passionate about education and capacity building and training. And those people, despite how amazing they are at science and how dedicated they are, are trying to are having trouble finding their, their way in terms of career paths and really struggling with that. So I would say from my perspective, that's actually the biggest barrier. I'm established enough. I can, you know, do this on the side because I, you know, have enough funding, but more junior people that really are passionate um, can't necessarily find an easy path to, to really dedicating as much time as I'd like to this in my, in my experience. I see a question from a future ID physician scientist. Uh, feel free to introduce yourself. I'm Dan I'm a current resident. Um, so I was wondering, uh, what makes that uh, new, what is it, the new mosquito special and why is it transmitting so much? And then two, do you have um, like health data in the cohort studies, do you have uh, like health, other health data for, the, for these longitudinal? So I'll, I'll answer the second question, which is whether we have other health data uh, from the cohorts, and, and, and the answer is yes. Uh, so we provide, as part of the uh, passive uh, surveillance, we provide all medical care uh, for, for these cohort participants. Actually, the, the, the cohort that I presented already finished, so we provided all medical care. So it was not just malaria, but, but, but all medical care. So we collect like a very rich uh, history of symptoms. Uh, we do not test uh, for other diseases like systematically because I mean that's that we didn't have the funding to do that. Uh, but interestingly, one of the uh, projects that we've nested as part of that cohort, uh, and this is in collaboration with with uh, Christina Tato at the Biohub, is testing uh, many of those non-malaria fevers, right? Because many times people come in with a fever but test negative for malaria. Testing many of these non-malaria fevers to establish uh, etiologies uh, of of other etiologies of fever in this population. But we do have self-reported data of antibiotic use, and we have uh, 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 report, like rich reported data of other symptoms as well at each visit. Yeah, to get, I'm not an expert, I'm not an entomologist, but some basic things I do know about Anopheles stevens eye, it's really, really well adapted to urban environments. It, unlike other vectors, it can, any small container that you have nearby, right near your household, um, it can breathe there. So it's, it's really in close proximity. It's a very competent vector. Um, the sporozoic rates are extremely high. So once it's infected, it, it's really easy for it to infect you. Um, and it also has insecticide um, resistance phenotypes, which make it difficult to control. Um, I was wondering, the talk was great, or both talks were great. Um, I was wondering if you could mention, I know some of the um, places that you study malaria are closer to elimination than others, and it becomes more important the um, flow of people and, and mosquitoes, and as opposed to kind of having a reposit of, uh, of um, one particular group. And I was wondering how some of the techniques that you were describing or, or might be different um, depending on uh, different patterns. Places in an infectious course. Yeah, I think I think that the techniques maybe are not as different, but the study designs are yeah. slightly different to get at that question of importation. So, so we have a cohort, for example, a cohort that just started last year. We call it the Suma cohort uh, in southwest Uganda, that is, which is a low transmission setting, uh, and, and and that's looking explicitly at the role of importation uh, on on sustaining malaria transmission. So, uh, for example, in the design of that cohort, like this also includes. Uh, surveillance of the health facility, but also households in the community. But a lot of a lot of 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 the data that we're collecting is around travel, right? Like like trying to figure out who's traveled, where they spend their time, how much of their time they spend at risk of malaria, and and so we go really deep there, right? In terms of the techniques, well, we 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 think that genotyping data and sequencing data will also add like a whole layer of information to 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 determine if these infections are interrelated, right? Like if they, or if they were coming from something. So, but, but it's probably like a similar method to what's used in our populations, but just focused on this, on, on this particular question. I'll just add briefly to, um, to that response that the, the analytical methods 
um, for tracking the spread and, and, and determining the origin of infections are really very nascent for, for malaria. You can't, it's, it's a, for many reasons, it's sexually recombining. People have multiple infections, not just a single infection, usually like a virus. So trying to track the, the spread and origin of using the genetics is quite challenging. And um, that's something our group has been focusing on. Max Murphy, who's a PhD student um, in, uh, at Berkeley right now working with us, is working on novel methods for estimating transmission networks from this data. I had one last selfish question perhaps, and maybe not just for myself, but for those in the audience with young children. You know, when you talked about the longitudinal impact with the malaria um, analysis that you showed, which is really fascinating, I was struck by parallels in my own life of repeated URIs over time <laughs> with children in daycare. But I was thinking about extrapolating it, not to that puny research question, but have these methods been extrapolated to things like, you know, outbreaks that result in shelter, you know, resulting from shelters or outbreaks internationally, the airport surveillance. Can you talk about other methods of extrapolating that interesting longitudinal data? Extrapolating the longitudinal data? I mean, what do you mean by extrapolating? Or other contexts where you might use similar techniques is what I meant. I mean, this is maybe not exactly what you're getting at, but um, we do, I mean, there are refugee populations in Uganda where people are, are uh, not well housed and there's outbreaks of malaria in addition to other diseases. Um, and some of our colleagues, uh, Melissa Conrad here at UCSF, uh, Stephen Tokwasibe in, in Uganda and others are, are trying to see how we can both provide better care for those populations and also use them to study uh, outbreaks of malaria and other diseases. Uh, I'll also say that, you know, Longitudinal doesn't necessarily mean a cohort, right? You can study at a health facility longitudinally over time to look for, you know, sentinel surveillance for outbreaks. And uh, an idea that Isabel and I have had that have, have not really gotten funded yet is to utilize more broadly the, the health facility network across Uganda uh, as a surveillance platform for looking for outbreaks of other diseases. Um, so basically creating a team to identify uh, suspicious spikes in, uh, in the incidence of particular diseases or syndromes and then have a team that can go out rapidly, collect samples and identify either through direct detection of the pathogen or serologic responses, what might be, uh, might, be might be responsible. So I think that's a, you know, kind of a, a bigger yeah. and more difficult question, but that's something that we could, that could be very valuable. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add also, not sure if it gets up your point entirely, but I, I, we have discussed many times how ultimately these very uh, detailed cohorts uh, that in, in our case, this was a malaria from the project, but there's HIV cohorts, TB cohorts, you know, that generally focus on a, on a single disease. And, and, and that's like a huge wasted opportunity, right? Like, so uh, thinking of ways in which you can leverage existing sample sets or ongoing studies to really go across multiple diseases. Uh, yeah, is something that, that we keep thinking about, and including upper respiratory infections. Very expensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much to both of you for your time and sharing your expertise and to all of you for listening. We'll see you back next week for our State of the Department by Dr. Wachter, which is also going to be hybrid. So in this room, as well as online, thank you both.